Take your Bibles, if you would, please, and open to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings, we're going to start with chapter number 17. 1 Kings chapter number 17. I want to begin to introduce to you tonight, if I could, uh, there's, I don't know that there's any way that I could get completely all of, uh, all, all, everything that I would like to make mention of uh, the prophet Elijah, but we will begin to look at him somewhat this evening. Because we are, we're introduced to uh, the man, and I, I want to try to, uh, I, I don't know, uh, Chris, how fast do you think you could look up the, look up, uh, see if you can find a map of ancient Gilead and uh, in that instance, and I'll try to show you basically where, uh, where Elijah came from and some of the circumstances that are around, uh, surround him. And so, uh, so 1 Kings chapter number 17, beginning in verse number one, the Bible says, and Elijah the Tishbite. Now, that has always kind of uh, thrown me off just a little bit because I'm thinking, what is Tishbite? What is, uh, what is, what is meant by that? And so I, I had to take some time to look it up. Does anybody have an idea when, it, uh, when the scripture says Tishbite, what it, is, what it is speaking of at that point? Does anybody know? Because I had to look it up myself because I thought, well, is it the fact that uh, uh, he was related to somebody named Tish? along those lines, and, uh, but basically what this means is there was a group of people in a particular locale, and, uh, and those folks that were, uh, <laughs> I, I was trying to equate it with something that, that we would understand today. Uh, if, if I use the term hillbilly, we, we have an idea what some of that somewhat means, uh, because it's like, okay, they, you know, they, uh, they fit into that category, and so, and that's a little bit what the word Tishbite means. There was a group of people that was right there in, uh, it was associated with Manasseh on the, uh, uh, actually on the east side of the Jordan and uh, in that uh, area of Gilead. And uh, Mount Gilead ran through that, uh, that little bit of uh, uh, that, that mountain, mountainous region there. And that group of people that lived there were called Tishbites. Uh, and Tish basically, uh, Tishbe, uh, Tishbai, uh, basically meant a group of people that had that uh, particular locale. And, uh, and so in that instance, Elijah associated with them. And then it goes on to say, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead? Gilead was the main area that was there. And uh, the group of folks that, that lived in that area uh, were called Tishbites. And uh, in that instance, so Elijah was associated with this group of people. It was not affluent. It was not uh, prominent necessarily, but it was that, that group of people that lived there. And so he associated with them, and God takes note of it here. Now, Gilead is that area, as I said, that's on the, uh, actually on the east side of the Jordan River. And uh, does he, does, uh, Brother John, do you think he has found something there? Okay, well, let's see if we can, uh, we'll try to drop the screen and turn the uh, things on here just a little bit, and, uh, and I'll try to show you the area where, uh, where Elijah uh, lived and things, and so, but in that instance, there's something that uh, gives us a little insight into who he was, where he was at, and why God used him to do a particular task. Now, understanding that he is now, comes on the scene here in uh, in 1 Kings chapter number 17, but we need to back up just a little bit and get why God was asking him to do something and why God was asking him to uh, get involved with something in the nation of that day. So if you would please turn back a page or so to chapter number 16, and we want to see uh, who it is that God is wanting him to help deal with and to uh, encourage, motivate, and keep on track. Now, as you, uh, in chapter number 16, there is given a number of kings uh, that deal with the northern tribe of Israel, and uh, the southern kingdom that is there is Judah. And uh, in that instance, as you, uh, uh, you see, okay, right over in it, it gives a, a very good sight there where you see the little cursor is where it says uh, Jabesh Gilead. 
right in between those two rivers that are there, actually, uh, and of course it's even stated here, uh, off to my right, right over here on this side, uh, you see where it gives a little bit of, of Tishbe. And so in that instance, that group of people that lived right there, and there's even the brook that is going to be mentioned. So I want you to notice that on the right side of the Jordan River that runs in between uh, up, uh, basically the Sea of Galilee and then runs down uh, all, to the, uh, the Dead Sea that's on the very bottom, that, that area there, the Jordan River connects the two. And so in that instance, on the right side is going to be a Gilead that's there, that whole area that runs along uh, that uh, there's a, a mountain region that runs along there. And that, of course, is where uh, Elijah came from. Now, right across the river, on this side over here, where you see the name Samaria, right over here. Now, the, the area that's over here, of course, that's the Mediterranean Sea. And, uh, but Samaria is basically where Elijah is getting ready to make his way to. So he crosses the Jordan River and makes his way over there because there is someone there that God is instructing him to talk to. So if you would, please, I want you to take note of 1 Kings chapter number 16 and look, if you would, in verse number 29. Verse number 29 says, And in the thirty and eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, that's the southern kingdom. So Asa has been ruling now for a number of decades. It goes on to say, uh, began Ahab, the son of Amri, to reign over Israel. That's the northern kingdom. And Ahab, the son of Amri, reigned over Israel in Samaria. Right over there in Samaria. So in that instance, it tells us here that he reigned 20 and 2 years. And it goes on to say in verse number 30, And Ahab, the son of Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of uh, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king, uh, king of Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So we see now why God is getting ready to send Elijah the Tishbite over there to him. And so in that instance, when we come back to chapter number 17, we see the events that are getting ready to take place. And God gets Ahab's attention by beginning to mess with his food source, his supply, his ability to be able to sustain. And it's kind of interesting because God can do one thing and change the whole landscape of things. And so in that instance, we see here that as God is beginning to deal with Elijah, he has already, and by the way, he has already dealt with Elijah. It's not just all of a sudden Elijah woke up, oh, and all of a sudden God said, okay, I got you something for you to do. There is, uh, there is a time that God has already been dealing, speaking, and, uh, and he knows who Elijah is, and uh, Elijah knows who he is. And so the events that take place here, beginning in chapter number 17, verse number 1, again, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth. Now notice he identifies him very clearly that he is the Lord God of Israel. The place that you're ruling right now, you may be king, but he's God. You may have a small little say in what goes on, but he is the one that rules the entire land. And you are subservient to him. That is literally what he was uh, making the, the statement. He was, he, he was doing it justly as he should. So he goes on to say, As the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And so all of a sudden Ahab says, Well, who do you think you are? And Elijah says, I'm the one that's turning off the rain. And everybody knows that if it don't rain, things don't happen. The, 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 the ground doesn't produce, the animals suffer, and things of that nature. Water became a very precious commodity at this time. And in this instance, the dew didn't show up. And in the desert area, it is very common for things to be very dew-ridden in the morning. Because at night, the temperature drops. 
So when the temperature drops, the moisture begins to settle. When the moisture settles and then the morning comes and the sun begins to come out and dew is covering everything, not now. And so now things weren't even watered in that, that manner. And it did not rain. And so verse number two says, And the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Get thee hence, and turn thee eastward, and hide thyself by the brook Cherith, that is, before Jordan. You see right over there, as it's stated. Uh, he was very familiar with this area. He was very familiar with the, the place that is there. And he says, I want you to go. And he says, I want you to stay there. And so that's what he instructs him. Verse number four says, And it, and it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, that I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. So he went and did according unto the word of the Lord. For he went and dwelt by the brook Cherith, that is before Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening. And he drank of the brook. So we see here now the prediction that he has made and the, and the statements that he has made that there's not going to be any water. Well, guess what? Eventually the water source even that he is at begins to dry up. But before we go any further here, there's something that I want to take note of is if we could. So if you would, you're right there in the, and uh, we've been introduced to Elijah. He's got a task that he has come to the king and the king has been so vile and he has gone against God so desperately and he's begun to lead Israel into false worship. Now he is going, and by the way, uh, anything that will we use that oftentimes and use that very simplistic thing, but anything that is going to take your attention away from God where uh, it, it's, it, it, your focus in that manner is going to be more on this area than it would be on God can be an idol. And in that instance, uh, we even as Christians need to be careful because there are idols that are going to show up in our life. And if we're not careful, we'll give them more attention and concern and time than we do to God. And so when it draws our attention in that manner, uh, now all of, us have, all of us have tasks, all of us have things to do, and all of us have things that, that grapple for our attention and in our time. I understand that. But God has got to have a place in all of that. And so in that, he is making it very clear here that God has to have a prominent place in your heart and life. Now, if you would please, uh, before we go any further with Elijah, I'd like for you to turn over to chapter number 19 because tonight I want to focus in on one thing in particular about that that you and I need to understand that uh, in the life of Elijah, one thing that he had that, uh, that is very necessary for all of us. Notice, if you would please, in chapter number 19, beginning in verse number 9, the Bible says, And he came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Now, of course, God comes to him and tells him, You're not the last, and you're not the only one, so... Uh, but, uh, but I want you to understand where he's at right now. He's very concerned. He's very frustrated. And, and fear is beginning to uh, grip his heart because he's done what God has instructed him to do. And man's reaction was not positive. Well, it's pretty common even today, isn't it? And so in that instance, you could see where you and I would fall into that category. But in that instance... God is still doing something here. So look at verse number 11. And he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by and a great and strong wind rent the mountains and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering in of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? I want you to take note of some of the things that are taking place here. Elijah is willing to obey. He is willing to do what God has instructed him to do. And God knows that. And he knows that. But for you and I, the thing that we need to understand is when God speaks, he oftentimes does not come in a great big boisterous voice. He oftentimes, and if you're anything like me, God has to really make it clear before I'm going to adjust or move or, or change things a great deal. 
because I believe if God has set me on a path in one particular area, I'm supposed to progress on that path until he makes it clear there's got to be a deviation or, a, 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 or an altering of, of that direction in one way or another. And God does that. He's very faithful to lead us in the pathway of righteousness, but it doesn't mean it's extremely rigid and it cannot be moved. Because if God decides to change things, that is certainly up to him. And it is our job to listen to what he says and then make the adjustments. And uh, just as Peter uh, in, in, the, in the New Testament. Now, they had been told, you may not eat of this particular animal. And so when the Lord came and said, kill and eat, he said, not so, Lord. He was being very rigid. And God said, no, what I have blessed, don't call common. So God sometimes has to change our direction a little bit to follow his will, not our will. Not our tradition, not what we think is only the, the correct pathway uh, that we have according to what we think is right. God sometimes makes adjustments. And uh, now, it is always going to be within the boundaries of his will and what he has already stated. But within the boundaries of that, sometimes we have to make some corrective measures. We have to uh, keep that, uh, that balance along those lines. And so we see here that God spoke to him in a specific manner uh, in a still small voice. So I want to mention four things, if I could tonight, about this very thing that you and I need specifically. Number one, God is speaking. God is speaking. Since God is speaking, he is speaking, of course, to his people. And we see here in the very first uh, words that are here, as he is beginning to speak to Elijah, verse number 10 says, And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts for the children of Israel have forsaken the covenant, thrown down thine altars and slain. And so he, he goes on to say uh, that, you know, I've, I've been trying to do what I'm supposed to do. Verse number 11 says, and he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. So he's given instruction here. God is speaking all the way through this. I, 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 I love the fact when you go through here, oftentimes, so Understand that God speaks in that still small voice. So take your Bible and turn back a page to chapter number 17 once again, if you would. Because the very second verse that we see about Elijah here is this. He says, and the word of the Lord came unto him saying, God is speaking. He is speaking to every last one of us that is in this room. He is willing to talk to us and he is willing to speak to us. And uh, not only willing, I, I'm assuring you right now, he is talking to you and I. He is. Because he's got something for you and I to do. And the only way that he's going to get that done is by him speaking to us and telling us what it's going to be, what needs to be done. With our heart, with our life, with our direction, with our families, with our future. So in that instance, God is speaking. That leads me to number two. And the question is, can you hear? Can you hear? See, there's only two aspects to that. You're either willing to listen or you cannot hear. Because there's plenty of folks that you may ask them, why are you not listening to what God says? Some folks can't hear because they have refused to hear. It's not the fact that God's not speaking. They have just refused to listen to what he says. And so it's not audible to them. It's not clear to them. They just don't hear it. In that instance, it, uh, you say, well, it's because oftentimes there is something that has prevented them from hearing. Uh, it, it, it's a little bit like this. If, okay, the, the reason why we have walls, doors, insulation, and things of that nature is because the nursery is right down the hallway. Now, we know there are some very precious commodities in that, in that nursery. We know that. But sometimes they don't know what's going on in here. And so when they begin to talk, their volume, their volume control is not, <laughs> is not always in check. They sometimes use their outside voice on the inside. Sometimes they uh, get to talking about things that, and, and doing things and just whatever the case may be. That's because they're still learning some of those things. So what we do is we prevent them from hearing us and prevent us from hearing them. So there is barriers between that. The problem is that sometimes God is talking and he is speaking to you and I, but we have put up barriers so that we cannot hear him. 
And God, it's not the fact that God's not speaking. God is always talking. He is always trying to get your attention. He is always speaking to you and I. The problem is, is we have put barriers in between uh, his voice and ourselves, whether it's by choice or whether it's by uh, just, as you see here, when we do those things that, as it is stated, and I, I use the term evil in the sight of the Lord, it puts up barriers so that we, they can't hear. Could God have talked to Ahab? Yes, he could. Had he talked to kings before? Yes, he had. But Ahab was not in a place of listening. He had put up barriers where he couldn't hear. Elijah had removed those barriers, had taken those things down, even as he said, look, I've been very jealous for the Lord. In other words, I want what he wants. I want to listen to what he says. And I have removed the barriers so I can hear what he says. And God was able to speak to him. God is speaking, so can you and I hear? If you cannot hear, that's a problem. There is a barrier there that has been placed. And the other thing is, I hear, I'm just not going to obey. So either there are barriers that you have put up and you cannot hear what God says, or you are not willing to listen even when he does speak. Those are the two options that you have because God is speaking here and he wants to speak. And he wants you to hear and he wants you to obey. The problem is, is either we have put up those barriers by choice or by just, what word am I looking for? Just our, our willingness to not listen to what he says. And so automatically there is by default a wall that gets put up. And in that instance, then we can't hear what he says. You ever wonder why you, you've asked yourself before, <clears throat> Now, we always have to permit that growth in grace, but if God is always speaking to us, and he always is, he is always trying to get our attention, he is always leading us in a path of righteousness, he is always giving us direction in some manner or another, always. Because now, we call it our character, our discipline, it's others that have helped us to develop those things, but it means that we have listened to a point where we understand that this is important, this is imperative. How come one person sees it and another person cannot? How come one person can see the importance of, of that and another person cannot? Why do some folks realize, I have got to read my Bible. I have got to pray. And other folks say, oh, I'll get by without it. How can some folks just realize, you know, I'm, uh, the, uh, that leads me to the very next thing. Number three, your character and discipline will be in direct correlation to your obedience to God's voice. Your character and discipline will be in direct correlation to your obedience to God, God's voice. So, in other words, if you cannot hear what he's saying, that is a problem. If you have not heard God, and by the way, sometimes it's very simple things. It's, it's the very things of, of where you look at it, it's like, why, why wouldn't somebody, okay, let, let's put it in practical terms, all right? <laughs> I'll, I'll pick on uh, Miss Amy and Brother Daniel here for a second. Does, does once in a while Ollie and Ellie, do they, do they make messes at home? Yes, they do. They do. And it's mom and dad's task to say, okay, you have to pick that up. You have to clean that up. You have to put your toys away. You have to, and it's to give those instructions. The reason being is they know that if they'll begin to listen now, that later on that still small voice that comes to them and says, Mom and dad are pleased when I obey. And it is, if I'm going to be the kind of young person that I should be, I've got to listen to what they say. So even if mom and dad are not standing there, that voice is still there, that still small voice, clean up, pick up, do what you're supposed to do. And they do it because that's the task. That's the thing that, that instruction, that still small voice that is still there, giving them the instruction, even though the audible voice that once was there is not there speaking it immediately. And I, I don't make God constantly have to tell you what to do when you know what to do. Say, well, I, I would pick it up, but God didn't tell me. Oh, no, he's already told you. Why are you not picking it up? Say, well, he, he didn't tell me to pick it up this time. Okay, he's told you to pick it up before. Pick it up every time until he tells you differently. That still small voice is that audible thing that once had given you very clear direction. Now it's supposed to be part of your character and your discipline to do it on a regular basis. That's why Bible reading is important. And that's why you've heard it from Sunday school. You've heard it on a regular basis because it is vital to your Christian growth. 
because your character and discipline will be in direct correlation to your obedience to God's voice. Now, and by the way, that means that when I've listened to it on a regular basis, when God speaks this time, it's very easy for me to hear. That's the removing of the barriers. That's taking them down so it's very easily heard because God does not oftentimes come in a great big bombastic voice. He was making it clear to Elijah, look, don't make me thunder and lightning to get your attention. If you have listened once and listened carefully, it's going to be very easy to hear me. Notice, he didn't move in some of the other things, but when he heard the still small voice, he wrapped his face in the mantle and then went out and began to listen. Number four, number four, your favor or frustration will be in accordance to your ability to hear his voice. Either your favor or your frustration will be in accordance to your ability to hear his voice. Because grace and favor accompany God's voice, frustration and demise accompany uh, our lack of obedience to his voice. So as Elijah here is getting ready to do some miraculous things, there are some things that oftentimes God wants you and I to do, which is understand this. If I want to have the favor of God, and his blessing and his help and guidance, then I've got to be willing to do what I'm supposed to do because he told me to do it yesterday and I keep doing it until he gives me another direction. Because the reason that Elijah was able to do... Now, let me ask... The, one of the very first things that Elijah tells Ahab is this. It ain't going to rain. And it didn't rain. Until finally there came a point where he said, Okay, I guess it's time... And it, this was years later. And uh, it's time to change things now. Let's, let's let the rain come. There's some amazing things that take place. There's some miraculous miracles that take place because of it. But understanding this, before Elijah was going to meet the, the problem on Mount Carmel, he had to be willing to listen to that still small voice. He had to be willing to when God said, you go by the brook Cherith and you wait there until, and I'm going to feed you with ravens. And that's exactly what he did until, until the brook dried up. And then God said, okay, now I've got something else for you to do. And so in that instance, God is speaking, can you and I hear? Are you willing to listen if he is speaking? If that's the case, then are you going to obey? Because those barriers will begin to put up when he speaks and you and I don't listen. But if it's to a point now that you cannot hear him when he speaks, that is a problem that you're going to have to seek God and say, Lord, help me to remove these barriers. Why in the world do I not have the same character that I need to have? Why is my life frustrated in this manner? Why is it so difficult? And why is things... Uh, now, to say this, frustrations are going to come through life. It just does. But God's grace is the thing that helps overcome those and continues to help press on. We all have frustrations and they always seem to mount on a regular basis. And they always seem to be in, almost insurmountable, but God is the one that gives grace to, along those lines. And so, uh, because problems are going to come, the, the refrigerator is going to quit cooling. It is. And you're going to be frustrated like nobody's business. Like, now what am I going to do? And on the way home, the check engine light is going to come on on your car. And you're going to barely make it home. And when you get there, you're going to find out the electricity has gone off and the hot water tank's gone out. And you're going to find out that the kids are <coughs> feeling sick. And it's like, now what have I got to do? And then the boss is going to call and say, you have got to come in here. Frustrations are going to show up. They just are. It's God's grace that says, okay, out of all these things, I still want to listen to what you have to say, God. I can't let the world just dictate everything about who I am and what I'm doing. You've got to help. And when that Prince of Peace shows up, it's like, as long as he is speaking, Everything else is going to take care of itself. And it does. But you're going to have to listen to what he has to say. And God is willing to speak. And he wants you and I to listen. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed for just a moment. Father, thank you again for the opportunity to be in your house. And Father, with our heads bowed and with our eyes closed, I ask that you'd please just help us now to surrender to your will. And to listen to your voice. And God, I do ask that you'd please help all of us now to seek your will to follow according to the voice that you tell us and the directions that we should have and just the, the daily discipline of life that you want us to conduct ourselves by so that we would be prepared and ready servants for thee. I ask that you'd please bless our church. Lord, help us to do your will. Help us to do the things that we should for thy sake. 
in Jesus' name, amen.